do you suppose they get the idea that the students have microscopes like that? I don't know. I'm Robert Muckle, Assistant Professor of Biology, and this is Dr. Catherine Buell, Distinguished Professor of Biology. And the purpose of this program is to provide a record for the Stone College archives on uh, some of uh, Catherine's recollections on her uh, professional career. Uh, Dr. Buell, you graduated from Oberlin, is that right? Yes, indeed. Uh, when was that? Way back in 1933. 1933? Yes, indeed. What? Uh, do you have any particular re recollections of, of Oberlin, uh, students, faculty, anything that you, you would uh, like to share with us? Well, I haven't thought about that for a long time, and would you uh, believe it, I never ever went back for commencement. Never ever was a loyal alumna and went back for a single thing. And it wasn't uh, until just two or three years ago that I ever even got back to the campus again. And uh, that place has changed, perhaps uh, more, you know, all these modern buildings that go up everywhere completely transform things. But you might be interested in the uh, building where the uh, zoo department held out. It was an old, old brick church which was reconstructed for the uh, use of the uh, labs. The lecture room was the, the uh, general sanctuary minus the pews. <laughs> <laughs> the gallery was the museum with museum cases all around up there. And the interesting thing about it was that uh, Oberlin of course was a community there, which was uh, highly congregational. They had two congregational churches, big ones, in the older days. And the first one, the first church where we, most of us went, was that. And the Zoe department, of course, was in the old second church, scientists. And that's where we held for. Seminar was in the, the uh, choir law and so forth. That's uh, interesting. Yes. Uh, now, your, uh, was your major, you had a, your major was biology at Oberlin, is this? Well, that was back in the days before uh, people got, uh, oh, perhaps should we say comprehensive enough to say Department of Life Sciences or Biology. Uh, zoology, which is always evidently more uh, predominant than the plant study, had the old second church and the botany department was in an old frame house a few blocks away somewhere. So it was zoology here and botany there. Of course, later I think they followed the general trend to have a more uh, unified thing, that is biology as a So your major was department. zoology then from old Yeah, time. that's right. I see. Did you have, did you have a minor or? Uh, no. No, of course you had to have the appropriate chemistry and all that, but but uh, not a minor as such, no. What other kinds of courses do you recollect that you uh, took at Oberlin? Anything uh, rather unique as compared to what our students may, might take now here at Doan? No, I don't think anything unique at all. We had the usual uh, fair of, of uh, history and English comp, and I always enjoyed going into the languages, so I had both French and German up to two, two years of French and three years of German, I guess it was. And all of that mixed in, but nothing outstanding, just the ordinary kinds of things one has today, more or less. Now, uh, mm -hmm. you were elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Was this at mm -hmm. Oberlin when mm -hmm. you graduated from Oberlin? Yeah. Where? Now, when you left, or when you earned your baccalaureate from Oberlin, where did you go then for, for school? Well, or? well, the big thrill associated with Oberlin was, of course, that marvelous summer at Woods Hole. 
Right. And they like to send the student. I think they sent two representatives every year. Now, was this when you went to Woods Hole? This Woods Hole, Massachusetts, the Marine right, uh, right. Research Station. Uh, was this during your? Was this after graduation or? Unfortunately, it was after graduation. They preferred to send juniors, and then uh, to have them come back and uh, to share the enthusiasm and all that. But it just happened that my opportunity came after. I had graduated. I see. Yes. Then, then after your summer at Woods Hole, you, uh, where did you go? Well, let me see. Well, then the, the family was living at St. Louis at the time, of course. So um, we started in graduate school mm -hmm. in uh, Washington University, which of course was in the city. And I was acquainted with that because before I went to uh, Oberlin, I'd spent a uh, year there on a short schedule because uh, when I got out of high school, I was too young to get into Oberlin. Mm -hmm. They didn't let you in until you were 16, and I was 15 at the time, so I was acquainted with Washington. I see. And that turned out to be very uh, fortunate. It's an excellent institution. Now, what, uh, how long were you at Washington? Well, I didn't try to hurry up the masters and do it in one year. I took two years doing that. And then, if you'll remember, 30, 33, 4, 5 was still in the midst of the Depression. I don't remember that very well. Oh, you don't? <laughs> oh, um, my usual style of arithmetic. Okay. Um, you don't remember personally, but no. you remember your history. Right you will recall that that was the time of the big depression. Sure. So nobody was just going right out and getting a job. So um, I took a third year catching up on the uh, Missouri State Teacher's Certificate requirements just in case. I see. So, yeah. and I've always been thankful I never had to teach in a secondary school. Don't save me from that, of course. Why, do, why, what were, what were your apprehensions about teaching in a secondary school? Practice teaching. You, you I, I pract oh, you bet I practiced taught. And that didn't go particularly well? Or <laughs> well, <laughs> I taught in a little high school, or I practiced taught, supposedly, in a um, high school in suburban St. Louis that I think wasn't a particularly high caliber of a high school, and the uh, teacher who was supposed to be in charge of me after I'd done the observing uh, totally abandoned me. He just walked off, left me there with these kids who of course had my number. They knew they could take a little practice teacher, and we were supposed to be having a uh, quiz or checking results, I've forgotten why. But anyway, they decided to take off. And they shot paper airplanes, they threw paper wads, they made bedlam, and there wasn't a thing in the world I could do with it in, in my total inexperience. I suspect that, I suspect that uh, kids haven't changed that much. I suspect they would do the <laughs> no. same thing today. If I they, expect so. If they could I do that. expect so. What, uh, now, what... Uh, what was your major, so to speak, uh, when you were working on your master's? Oh, it was zoology. And zoology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did, did you, uh, uh, what was your, your research, or did you do a research topic oh, yes. for your master's? What, what was that? The uh, uh, cytology of the malpighian tubules of the corn worm. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. You know, we lived in St. Louis, which was a 45-minute streetcar ride from the university. Of course, streetcars don't exist anymore, but they did then. And uh, my father would take me out, uh, out of the city in the cornfields to pick the worms, and they'd pick the worms and put up an appropriate vegetation in this uh, stationary box. And I've often wondered, after I'd collected my material and I was going back to school to work on it, as I rode on those streetcars, here I had this innocent-looking little box, but it was crawling with worms. 
I don't know what my seatmates would have thought. Caused a mild panic, I suspect. Yes. Now. Yes. Now, when you, so you, you when you finished your your master's degree, uh, did you go right on for your your doctor of philosophy degree? Then? Oh my no. What? I taught here a good many years before I decided to go on for the other degree. Uh, when did you uh, when did you come to do? The fall of thirty six. What, uh, and then when was it that you, uh, you came here in, in 1936, when did you, you go back to school to earn your, uh, to work on your Doctor of Philosophy degree? Well. Or approximately, when would that have been? Oh, that would have been uh, middle 40s. I see. So you taught here several years then. Yeah. What, uh, uh, where did you, uh, where did you uh, work on your, your doctor's degree? Oh, University of Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. What, uh, uh, how long were you, did you work on your doctor's degree? Well, sometimes I wish I'd kept a record to see. Of course, you know, or maybe we back up here a little bit. Um, one goes to summer school interminably. And to start out with, or maybe we should go back here a little bit. When um, I came, one of the things I had to teach was geology. The second semester of the first year I was here, and I'd never had a smidgen of geology anywhere in my whole life. So naturally, uh, the first thing I did the summer after I came was to go out to uh, Boulder, Colorado, and take summer work in geology and of course you start going to summer school and that's the thing you do with your summer that was of course a critical necessity that particular summer but any other time you just keep keep going and then uh, I'm not just sure how I happen to wind up at Wisconsin going up there to different places you go to summer school and uh, one summer some one of the uh, Teachers up there asked me, well, why, why don't you uh, start applying this to something? I was just going for the sheer fun of it to right. <laughs> learn. That's what I was wanting to do. And they said, well, why don't you start uh, making it add up? So I would say 44, 43, 4, yes, that's along in there. And then uh, what, uh, what, uh, was your area of emphasis when you were in, in uh, working on your doctor's degree? Well, I found I was more um, interested in the, the uh, flowering plants. They really had a, a tremendous uh, professor in that area, and I remember taking a course one summer in the angiosperms. Do you recall his name? Try again. Her name. Her name, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> yes, yes, she, uh, Dr. Emma Fisk was a oh, tremendous sure. person. Sure. And, uh, of course, naturally, I wanted to continue working in that area and work with her. And, of course, obviously, she was the one that uh, took care of the, the, uh, thesis when the time came and all of that kind of thing. What was your, your, your uh, uh, thesis, your dissertation, uh, uh, your research organism, and, and uh, in general, well, what kinds of things did you do? Well, the title of the, the uh, research topic was Developmental Morphology in Dianthus, and Dianthus is the garden pink, of course. And the uh, idea was to follow through a complete study of the seed development, which is the structure of the flower, the development of the, the uh, embryo and all of that, the whole life history of that as a general background. These are your illustrations here? Oh, yes. Yes, of course, that goes on interminably, making the drawings, the thousands of slides you make to, to uh, get at the material. 
But you published three papers in the American Journal mm -hmm. of Botany? Yeah, that was the general background paper. And then uh, the one on the, the uh, wait a minute, that's the wrong one. One on the uh, nutritional changes, where the developing uh, structures get the, the uh, food that they use to develop with. And this is a shift in the uh, starch deposits, which of course are the prime food source all the way through, and it was something of that character that hadn't been done, just a matter of following through and getting the information there. Nothing earth-shaking, but I have seen this uh, paper quoted in books and right. so now, on. Is, this, on the is this a paper that's quoted in, in Weir and Stocking and the... No, th this and the hybrid business here to show how development gets upset. Uh, particularly at that time, back there in the latter 40s, it was quite uh, common to to, uh, <clears throat> to have things develop in an abnormal way, to have the fertilization as something that wouldn't ordinarily be doing this, and then why doesn't it work? We know that uh, hybrids don't pan out most of the time, or I, why didn't they? Well, of course, it turned out to be the upset of the endosperm, which is the food source for the developing embryos and now these so were on. these were hybrids in what uh, well between two species of um, of dianthus and dianthus I see. to have a horde of plants in the greenhouse and go down hand pollinate them and all that kind of thing i see how did you happen to choose dianthus well the first place it was one that hadn't been worked on to that extent <coughs> And uh, that's critical. You've got to have an organism that hasn't been done. And it helps to have one that's relatively simple, relatively easy to get a hold of. And uh, also, since I actually carried this through into a study of the development of the seedling too, uh, it helps to have an opposite leaf plant. I can remember when we went riding around, uh, Dr. Fisk and I, trying to think, well, now what plant do you want to work on? Availability. Well, we found out that the uh, horticulture gardens, in connection with the Ag College section of the university, had some good uh, beds of dianthus. So <laughs> way before anybody was up in the morning, I would get out and rob the horse garden <laughs> to uh, get my material enough to check on it to see if it was going to work out and have, uh, have the ovules in appropriate positions where you could get good sections of them. You have to test out different sorts of plants, but... What do you, uh, sections, what do you mean? Well. I mean, um, when you slice the bottom of the pistol, you need to have the ovules so that there are many, many ovules that you can get good sections of um, at a con in a convenient way. And this, of course, had hundreds of, oh, hundreds, that's the exaggeration, had many ovules in a pistol so that you could uh, see how that worked out very nicely. Uh, you wouldn't get anywhere if you selected a plant that just had one ovule in his pistol. And you'd go to all that work and only have one chance for the stage you were looking for. Mm -hmm. So it was a lucky choice all the way around. And, and uh, this is the textbook in, in mm -hmm. which the, uh, some of your... your yeah, your you can find the... the uh, Let's see now, that, it would be, this one I think would be the one that has the sheet of pictures. Yeah, that shows you how many ovules there are in the pistil. You take a section through there and mm -hmm. get a whole lot of them, so there's no, and this no is, problem. This is some here. of your work here? In yeah. Here's the page that corresponds to this that got into the textbook. Mm -hmm. Here, this was really a, 
a lucky one. When you uh, run across something like that, you've really got to find where That's you've got late. two telophases in the formation of the spores. Mm -hmm. Yes, and textbooks have a way of making mistakes, you know. Right. It left off a plural there. And here they call this eight-celled embryo sac. It's no such thing. There are eight nuclei. Right, right. Somebody just doesn't do the proofreading or whatever. Did you ever use this, this as a text in your class? Oh, yes. But there have been years when I didn't. Right. Have you, yes. have you ever uh, uh, course, had an opportunity to correspond with Dr. Fisk after your... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We used to write to each other all along. Of course, she's gone now. Right. But, uh, oh, certainly. What, uh, uh, how did you decide to, uh, to study biology? Why, why did this have any particular fascination for you? Well, that, uh, that goes back a long way. That goes back to high school. And uh, I have all kinds of sympathy for these students that put off their science. And when they do finally take a science, they don't choose physics right off. They choose the easiest one, which of course is biology. And uh, that's just exactly what I did when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I put off science, I put off science, and finally when I was a senior, I decided, to, well, I decided, it was decided for me that I had to have Right. A science, all right, so I took biology, and that was that. Before that, I'd always been uh, perhaps more inclined to uh, English and history and other such things, but then there was, there was biology, and that turned out to be the thing I enjoyed the most, surprisingly enough. The more you studied it, the, the more you enjoyed it, so you Yes, definitely, because uh, when you go to, to uh, college, right after high school, you have to start thinking what you want to do, and I wanted more of that, so there was no problem there. Went what, right straight into that. Have your interests changed with, uh, as far as biology? Would flowering plants still be, of, uh, are, are they still of the most interest to you, or is it, would it be hard to pick out one general area in biology that you're interested in? Well, I think I'd still stick with the flowering plants, but it's interesting when uh, I started out, I was doing just like everybody else did, uh, went in for the animals first, because uh, when I was an undergraduate, I didn't have a scrap of plant anywhere. And uh, when I was doing the master's work at Washington, I didn't have any either until I decided it was about time to learn something about plants. And so I'd never had any kind of uh, botany as such. And of course, naturally, it didn't take me into the general introductory, general botany course. They put me in, t in uh, plant anatomy or something of that sort. And, so, and I, this this was when you were when you were when I was working on a master's. Oh, at uh, Washington, I see. Yes, and so I soon found out that plants were my thing. Do you have any uh, uh, particular recollections of Wisconsin that uh, that uh, have remained with you? Uh, well, it's a wonderful place. That is. Um, of course, it's located on uh, land between two lakes, I guess, and the campus is on that big hill. Right. You're looking down, it's absolutely marvelous location. Um, I don't know, one just gets a general affection for the place where you put in so much of your life. It doesn't sound like the old Congregational Church at Oberlin, though. <laughs> well, uh, Old Burge Hall, uh, of course, was the old uh, building there. The botanist turned to the right and the zoologist turned to the left in a big stairway that goes up on either side. And I think 
no, of course, one wanted to make a joke. You'd say they didn't, two halves of the building didn't speak to each other. But it wasn't <laughs> quite as bad as that. But uh, they had, when I first uh, went there, you could see the history in the microscopes. I mean, in the style of the microscopes. Right. And the uh, light filters, some of those are like big Earl Meyer flasks filled with, what was it, some blue fluid of one kind, sulfate or probably. copper sulfate, possibly, whatever Of course, Wisconsin has a lot of tradition. Oh, yes, I should say it has. Well, see, now, you came to Doan in 1936, mm -hmm. then. Uh, what you indicated earlier that you uh, uh, began teaching geology the, the first year, what, mm -hmm. what were some of your other teaching responsibilities here at Doan? Well, primarily, um, primarily, I was Mr. Carlson's assistant. Who was, uh, who was Mr. Carlson? <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is, was the biology department. Oh dear, it's uh, difficult to take it just like that. He is a, uh, I keep saying is, was a person that uh, was here for, I wouldn't want to start quoting dates, but um, he was here when I came about as long as, say, when you came, I'd been here before you. And he'd been here for more. 30 years then. Oh, yes, 30, 35, I'm sure he, he had that uh, span of time, and he really molded the place. And I hope we never quite get away from the original a frame of his leadership at that time. What, so then, what were your teaching responsibilities? All right. Um, Mr. Carlson had all of the classes except one. The first semester, I had to teach advanced physiology. Why? And I understand that's because he didn't like to teach physiology. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> he never said so, but I'm sure that was it. Because as uh, I may have said before, we're both uh, old line morphologists. And uh, he would probably be very happy to do the comparative anatomy and the embryology and all those other things and let me sweat out the physiology, which is what I had to do, of course. And th that was the first semester, and then the second semester, of course, was this geology I see. thing. Otherwise, I attended the class. Of course, he did all the, the uh, classes for all the elementary courses and all the advanced courses so except that and one. Discuss, Absolutely discussions. everything. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, I took care of the labs. I see. And that was the days when we had... Uh, the beginning course was a, wait a minute, it was a four-hour course in those days, but you did five hours worth of work for it. Uh, three classes and, four, wait a minute, six hours of lab, two labs, one to four, and everybody did this. But this, you'd do a semester of general botany and a semester of general zoo. Uh, yeah, that's right, and everybody did it. And that meant that when we had a large class, there were three sections. And I remember how triumphantly happy Mr. Carlton was one day when he said, well, I believe three sections are here to stay. And what that meant was Monday, Thursday afternoons, one to four, was section A, Tuesday and Friday was section B, and Wednesday and Saturday morning was Section C. And, of course, I did all the preparation and uh, was responsible for all the labs, graded all the drawing pads, or graded them, checked all the drawing pads, and graded all the tests and everything. When you say prepare for lab, what, what kinds of things uh, did that involve? Well, grow the beans for the seedlings, set the grass, the seedlings going so we'd have roots and so forth. 
And of course, those were the days when we were working on a tight budget. And we didn't just send off to a supply house and uh, get fully injected animals to work with. And of course, this was well before the uh, days of the, the uh, fetal pig. We used frogs for the vertebrate thing in general. So, and Mr. Carlson would order a batch of live frogs. And it was up to me to uh, take these frogs etherize them, prepare this colored starch mixture, take them out, open up the abdomen, take the uh, needle and inject the frogs. Right. And we did that to crayfish too. Where did you get your crayfish? Did you the order? Pot order. <laughs> Who said order anything? We were economizing. We got the crayfish from the bug pond. And I would go out with a pail and a rake and rake around the bug pond and keep my fingers crossed, hoping we would come up with enough crayfish. And then, of course, I had to uh, bring those in and inject those crayfish and use those. The uh, little pool that we call the wishing pool now, mm -hmm. was, was this uh, a good place oh, for collecting yes. those days also? Oh, yes. And there, the pools down in the park in front of this pergola area now are all filled in, but that was another uh, big area where we did a lot of collecting. But there was, really was very little that we uh, ordered from a supply house. Well, earthworms, yeah. things of that character wouldn't be quite that easy to handle, but it's very little ordering of material. I remember when I, when I first came, we used to collect the uh, the uh, so-called distilled water, the spring water from the from the pergola. I suppose that's where you had obtained the distilled water all of these years. Well, I don't know as I ever thought of it as being distilled water. You mean right. you use it for making well, solutions? Well, or, or uh, let's say pure than what we'd expect to get if we were using city water. City water. Well. So I never thought of it as being pure chemistry. I guess I shouldn't have said distilled because, of course, yeah. it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. what, uh, uh, what was the campus like in those days when, when you arrived here? Well, the center of the campus, of course, was uh, farther south. Now the whole center shifted to a completely different place. But, of course, we had uh, Merrill Hall on the Science Building and Gaylord was in full swing then. Of course, Fries Hall, Dining Hall, was the main social center area. The Fries Hall Parlor you had all the big receptions in the Fries Hall Parlor. And uh, the first two years I was here, I had actually lived in Fries Hall. They had, uh, oh, I believe three faculty people lived in uh, Freeze Hall, and of course that drive was mud. We used to enjoy watching from the windows up there to see which uh, ones of the parents were going to get stuck in <laughs> the <laughs> mud as they brought their students to school and, and so forth. Well now, so the classes would have been in, in uh, uh, Merrill. Uh, Gaylord, was it used oh, yeah. for classes, Gaylord? Oh, yeah. And then the con, or uh, what's a more appropriate name for the con? Well, we always used else? to joke it's Lee Memorial Chapel if you come from the West, and the Conservatory of Music if you come from the East. <laughs> so it depends which on door your, you go in. your point of approach, I guess. Yes, and of course that was the center of all the public occasions, naturally. Where, uh, was Doan what well, were there many houses around Doan then, or were you rather uh, separated well, from the rest of the community? No, I, I think I remember the, Quite a the few houses, town right? was just about the same. Of course, not all these developments all over the hills. Right. Of course, uh, there was a field there where the new dorm is now. And I remember that was the field where I first realized that wheat rust was something that happens at home and not something out of the textbook. 
Then, of course, all of uh, all of your classes uh, would have been held in Carnegie. Oh yes. Science. Yes, definitely. What, uh, um, how would you? I don't know any particular things you'd like to say about the classrooms or the laboratories or any fond recollections of. Uh, I think you have some fond <laughs> recollections there, don't you? Yes. <laughs> Why don't you chip in with one or two? Then I'll fill in, maybe. Well, I guess my favorite one was the uh, the, the biology classroom on the main floor. At the uh, the seats that were in uh, the pews that uh, were hard to get in in and out of, and uh, uh, fairly uncomfortable for the students. But uh, I can remember when we wanted to darken the room to show films and so forth with the crank that lowered all of the uh, all of the curtains in the room at the same yeah. time. I always thought that was rather ingenious. Yeah. Much much uh, handier than, than what we have now in our new building. But, uh, um, did you ever happen to turn that crank and have the rope break when you had uh, planned the whole class period on the, <laughs> the basis of projection? And then you couldn't yeah. darken the room, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Then you had to make an instant change in your plan. Was that now? Excuse me. Go ahead, your friend. Well, I was going to say those those pews. I know they've taken an awful lot of, of um, shall we say, almost ridicule, but they were terrifically handy. As far as uh, variation in the uh, number of students you could accommodate in a class, if you wanted to be real comfortable, you could, and you had a fairly uh, good sized class, they could sit three in a row. If uh, you had more people, you could sit four in a row. And if you really had a tremendous uh, influx, it's possible to sit five in a row. What would, uh, I don't, uh, with five in a row, what, do you remember what would have been the maximum seating capacity? I don't remember the number of, of rows. Well, let's see. I can't be sure whether there were five or six on each side. Probably more likely five. So we're talking about as maybe as many as fifty students yeah. in the yes. in that classroom. Yes, and I can remember that uh, we did have uh, when we had the most uh, the largest students in or number of students in that introductory class. We did get between fifty and sixty in that class. Was this always the major classroom for biology, the main classroom? Or oh what? yes, no. oh yes. I don't believe we had uh, classes anywhere else. Oh, there might have been a time when uh, there could have been a class in the basement, but not. I think I have had one down there, but that was when other people began using the. Were the, the freshman room. labs always upstairs? Uh, oh, yeah. The classroom? Freshman upstairs. And the advanced the labs down downstairs. in the basement. How, was, yeah. what, how would you. Uh, any particular uh, memories of the equipment or. or uh, uh, that you like to tell us about? <laughs> Maybe that's rather obvious. Yeah, the there it is, right there. <laughs> so. Yes, all our microscopes were uh, like that. Like, like the I older came. scope. Yes. Yeah. This is. Uh, yes. And I'm and not sure uh, what brand of scope this is. I, the objectives are Bosch and Well, Lincoln. yes, I guess it's uh, just as well to say that's but. what it is. They vary a bit. But uh, it was my job every fall to clean that. <clears throat> to uh, clean all the lenses especially and, and uh, see that the microscopes were uh, functioning reasonably well. Not uh, just parfocal arrangements or anything like that, but just the, the technical, the cleaning job about that. Were these good yes. microscopes? Oh, sure. There's nothing wrong with those except they're out of style. Really, they have good lenses in them, and actually, if you take an ordinary student microscope today, it doesn't have a whole lot more in it except ocular and, and the usual 10x and 43 objectives there. This particular one has a condenser on it, but we had many that just had that simple plate with the holes in it, which some modern microscopes have. So you would, we'd have a maximum magnification of 430 times yeah. here, and, and yeah. that's... Yeah, uh, which is the safe 
uh, magnification for the general student. Of course, then with the newer microscopes that we purchased this year, it's rather quite a contrast with the complexity of the scope. But uh, uh, while we can go to a thousand magnification with with this scope, uh, probably. Uh, uh, as far as the lenses are concerned, really not all that much difference in as far as the quality of the lenses, if they were to compare the scopes in before these were scratched yeah. and used and so yeah. with the lenses. Well, now, um, you keep remarking every now and then that these, my goodness, you can see things with those that you can't, even with our better ones that would come in between here someplace. Uh, what do you think makes the difference? Why are these, not necessarily the binocular one, because the students don't have that. That's a special research style microscope. But why are these so much I think the better? Big, I think the big difference is the, the, uh, the larger field that you get, the larger lenses. Ah, yes. Uh, so you have a bigger field, and then also you have a better light source, so that you can, you have uh, the light, of course, being on a transformer, mm -hmm. you can manipulate the light more, and I, I'd say with the wider oh, field. Oh, I see. And uh -huh. with the transformer on the light, I, th I think this is what uh, makes it makes the newer scopes much yes. better. Well, of course, in the old lab, the seats all face the windows, so you got daylight from the outside. Right. Right straight around. Right. Of course, now we're more dependent on electricity. How? Uh, what are some of your recollections of students in those early years? How, uh, how would you compare the students of, that uh, you had in those days compared to the students that we have now? Or are there any, do you see any differences? Uh, are there any differences in your opinion? Well, when you think of students, I think one can be fairly safe to say that you have you have your headaches, your minor annoyances, the uh, ones that you get along with beautifully, and then you have the special, special jewels that are particularly uh, oh, lovely people and have all the good work motivation and everything. You have the whole gamut from the, the terrible to the wonderful, no matter whether you're thinking about um, 1885 or the year 2000. Your okay. eyes shine when you talk about the better students. <laughs> well, they should. They deserve it. So yeah, you're saying there, so there wouldn't be all that much difference then? About individual students and individual personalities, I'd say. Mm -hmm. No, but everybody changes with the customs sure. of the time. You didn't have to... Uh, concentrate on the eyes of a student so that you wouldn't get hung up in his beard like you do nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can always remember the sign that was in the old basement uh, lab in Carnegie Science. The, uh, and I, I, I suspect that Dr. Carlson made this sign. I, I don't know, but it, uh, the sign uh, said that there would be, uh, there should be no loud talking, whistling, in or near the science building. Absolutely. Definitely. And you towed the mark when uh, you were there. And I think that's a, a, uh, another thing that one can interpret historically. Don't you think that, uh, oh, say in the 19th century, there are more of these people that were just strict uh, formal disciplinarians sure. that believed in uh, proper kinds of dress, your, well, your dress and your grooming and your behavior and everything is military academy style. And this aids in, in uh, concentration. That was a big point with uh, Mr. Carlson, that you tend to business, you concentrate, you do not chew gum. I can, I can remember that was one of his special things, he would not tolerate gum chewing in his class. I think I can remember seeing him yet cruise up to a student that was chewing gum and 
demand the specimen right then and there, just like that. That just was not done. You couldn't concentrate while you were chewing gum. How would you, uh, uh, would you care to say anything about the faculty uh, uh, at Doan at the time as compared to, to uh, the faculty now? Do you see many differences in, in faculty or? Well, I think my time overlapped. The, um, when I first came here, the old guard was on hand. Mr. Carlson was here, uh, Dr. Taylor, the history man was here with Dean for a time. Um, hey, uh, Dr. Hayhoe was in philosophy, psychology. Dr. Burridge, I can remember he was a registrar and one of my first little duties was to assist at the registration with writing, helping write cards and stuff like that. So um, I overlapped. Oh yes, Dr. Julia Hawks was the uh, astronomy, math teacher, Mr. Olson, uh, studied with her. So I overlapped. The faculty I remember best were those, um, well, the old guard of the generation uh, previous to me. Now, of course, I'm the old guard now, right, and right. you're overlapping. <laughs> right. On it goes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just the general change in the uh, in the times, the different yeah. attitudes of toward uh, strictness, discipline, things of that sort, and dress. The students were required to to uh, not wear jeans, and all these things, which now, of course, are relaxed, and the whole country's relaxed sure. as far as that goes. It isn't just this place. Are there any particular changes that uh, that uh do you regret uh, uh, as far as what's happened here at Doan? Or maybe appreciate anything that comes to mind? Well, I know actually you can't turn clocks back and people do change. But um, I regret the idea and I may be wrong on this, but I hear from what students tell me that it's not easy to study in the dormitories. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I know in the old days uh, there were quiet hours that were observed and the dormitory was an appropriate place to study. I think a lot of discipline from that standpoint has uh, been relaxed. I, of course, I'm a member of the old guard, so naturally, I would think that. I, uh, I regret that the students finally got to the point where they couldn't stand going to chapel and convocation. Mm -hmm. uh, students always have slept in chapel and slept in convocation and, and uh, studied surreptitiously and so forth. But I do miss having those uh, convocations when the whole student body was together so and you had the opportunity to get in on a lot of different kinds of programs. I admit sometimes convocation was a bore and it must have been a horrible responsibility to have every Thursday something worthy of the attention of the whole community but I do, uh, I do miss that. Right and another tiny little thing I miss, um, Merrill Hall burned down, of course. Right. That was the first year that I was here. Yes. All right. Now, have you ever been to a football game? Sure. Okay. What's the, uh, what's the song when things really get going? What do we sing? Merrill will ring. That's tonight. Tonight, right. Merrill will ring tonight. Right. Now, I wonder what proportion of the student body knows what they're singing about. That's All right, true. do you know what used to happen? In the good old days, if we won that football game, there was a race to see who could get to the top of Merrill Tower and ring the bell. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Merrill will ring tonight. If we lost, everybody went home quietly, naturally. Right. All right, and Merrill rang for a brief period. And that, unfortunately, was run in the ground a few weeks ago by some students that didn't have, shall we say, restraint, and rang that bell for a solid hour, hour and a half. How long did it go? I don't want to exaggerate too much, but it was enough to drive the whole town out of its mind. This was just recently? Oh, within the last 10 years. Oh, I see. And okay. I do wish that uh, beautiful tradition could get reestablished. That's nice. What kinds of, uh, what kinds of uh, activities have you participated in here at the uh, Dome? That, uh, Say, excuse me, yes. before we get on to okay. something else, that was all negative. That okay. was all. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but positive. I think the, the department is really booming. Where did those microscopes, what was the big grant that brought us all these wonderful microscopes? It was an anonymous gift. Or what it, was it? It was $100,000 and uh, in the past Oh, in the past two years, we've we've uh, been fortunate enough to have close to a quarter of a million dollars in grants for various pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, these microscopes were were purchased with an anonymous gift of one hundred thousand dollars, of course, plus uh, much other equipment. But uh, um, we acquired uh, seven, sixteen new microscopes mm -hmm. with that money, yeah. plus again, as I said, All much other equipment. equipment. But, yes, we're yeah. Very, well, that's marvelous having this communications building with all it has to offer i regret that the place doesn't have an organ um, i think the fact that we have a bookstore now on the campus is marvelous and there are are many things that are definitely positive there's no doubt about that and before we leave the past completely here, I brought these things just to demonstrate how Mr. Carlson always made things himself. These slide trays, but the important things on the back. <laughs> you throw Threadly. away nothing, you utilize what you have. How many people now remember Chipso, which would be a comp competitor to Oxidol and the line? And then the imprint or the design, Mr. Carlson designed this thing and it was put the on the label biology dome. Right. Biology. Yeah, on the report covers and on the notebooks that went with the student equipment and so on. So a tradition of using what you have, your own ingenuity. What kinds of activities have you participated in here at Doan or, or through your life that uh, have been very valuable to you and, and uh, pleasurable for you? Well, the thing I think of most, of course, naturally, is the uh, music angle. Um, and probably one of the things I uh, value most is the uh, various friendships I've had with members of the uh, music department, some of them with whom I have studied. I took piano lessons for years and years and years. And I can remember uh, after the first year I was here, I uh, had a little oh, sort of post-mortem conversation with Dr. Carlson and uh, I thought I'd better fess up. I said, I suppose you know that <laughs> that uh, I took uh, piano lessons this uh, second semester. And he sort of said, well, you could have waited till your second year. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, I think I probably chalked up more practice hours in the old con than any other person alive, just because I've been here that long. Uh, have you continued this now, or are you still? Oh, yeah, sure. And before we get too far, I should put in something for uh, Mrs. Carlson. 
uh, Dr. Carlson's wife was a musician and she worked, or she was uh, in the music department over there. And of course, she was always interested in my uh, musical tendencies and so forth. And then, of course, I'd play in the solo classes and student recitals and all that kind of thing, naturally. Yes, and that goes on a pace, more or less. How about the music programs at the college over the years? Have you, uh, is, have you, do you normally try to attend those? Or? Oh, heaven, yeah. One always goes to all of the, the uh, concerts occasionally. One slips up and doesn't get there, but naturally those are outstanding things to attend and show interest in. I don't know. I, well, of course, last year you were uh, uh, elected by the senior class as uh, Doan College's outstanding teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know by first-hand experience, I've, having your students in my classes, that uh, students do learn in your classes. And uh, I'd like to ask you what kinds of things that you, you do in your classes uh, that uh, help your students learn. What, uh, uh, I get, when I first thought of this question, I was thinking something of what your opinion would be or what, what uh, would be the attributes of a good teacher. And, and I think, uh, well, in our previous discussions, that this would be a little difficult to answer. So I guess the most appropriate way to ask this would be, what, again, what kinds of things do you do in your classroom to... Uh, to uh, teach your students to help them learn? Well, of course, a teacher never knows what actually does catch on, but I can certainly uh, mention a principle or two. And one the thing to start with is that you um, should always try to build on what the students already know. Start at that point. And um, I always have fun the first time a class meets to probe backgrounds, to find out they've had uh, high school biology, what do they know about this, that, and the other. Uh, how do they start? And then... When, how, do you, how do you do that when you're probing? What, what, uh, what kinds of things do you do? Well, um, have you ever heard of photosynthesis? Anybody in this room ever heard of that term? And of course, the very minute you get a word like that. I get into another thing that I never, never resist is the word structure. You start putting this word down on the board and the, the uh, synthesis and the light. All right, what is it? And so on, and just see what it is or try asking other things to see if, if certain processes are familiar to them in any way and so on. And I think one of the big things is uh, word derivation. You have to know the language that you're using. And I find myself interrupting myself in the middle of a class. Here I'll be putting this word on the board. My, that's a beauty. <laughs> and then we'll stop and chomp it up and see where it comes from and all that kind of thing. And. Um, when you have parts of words that way that students may not know, you can frequently think of common, ordinary words that contain those same parts. Everybody's heard of a hypodermic, and if they don't know either one of those, as it comes in another kind of a word, there it is, sure. right in front of you. Of course, the next big principle is uh, never to ask answer a question if you could possibly avoid it. And uh, in training lab assistants or giving them suggestions, of course, they're all <laughs> instructed as they work with students, not to just dish out the information straight. You try to lead the student around to make him answer his own question. 
And there you go back to the same principle we mentioned a moment ago about building on what they already know. They're, they've had a certain amount of the course, certain things they ought to know. They shouldn't be blank on this point. And then you maneuver around and get them to answer that. Of course, sometimes you get these pure, lazy questions, and all you need to do then is just to shove the dictionary at them. Mm -hmm. Or when you say, go look it up, doesn't mean I don't know. Find it out for yourself. When you normally, in, in majority of your classes, would you say you conduct them through more of a uh, question-answer type thing? Uh, do you normally lecture to your classes, or is it the question-answer type well, thing primarily? I don't like too much of just a straight lecture. Of course, it depends on the material that you have, how much you can expect of the background of the students. Of course, sometimes it is necessary to bring out uh, new material that isn't in the book or uh, from other sources or things that you know perfectly well the students don't have any any occasion to know but I don't usually start out at the beginning of the period and just uh, talk straight for 50 minutes if at any point I think the uh, students should know something about this or could in any way uh, well, work it in to uh, something based on their earlier experience Why would we uh, stop and get it. And another interesting thing is that when you do ask questions, you utilize every answer you get. I mean, you start uh, with the answer you get. It may be way off. All right, fine. Uh, why is it off? What misunderstanding did the student have that made him say it that way? And sometimes the questions that aren't satisfactory uh, turn out to be more instructive than the ones that just get the point right off, and there you are. Do you feel the laboratory is important in the study of biology? Well, I'm tempted to use the slang expression and say that the lab's the name of the game because uh, what are we studying anyway? Uh, what supply house is it that put out on his little rulers uh, study nature and art, not books? Uh, don't neglect the books particularly, but uh, seeing the actual organisms, the, the thing itself is extremely important. And I think that also um, teaches the uh, art of observation, reporting observations, and all of this. That's, that's where you really get down to business. It's where you actually have the organisms right there. How do you, how do you uh, conduct your laboratories? What kind of emphasis, or where do you place your emphasis in the laboratory, would you say? How do you go about... Uh, uh, conducting a laboratory? Well, I think perhaps you'd say traditional. You have a certain uh, subject matter here. If you're working on uh, stems, you start out and you hope you have some live plants around. You make razor blade sections of these, and then that is to see the, the uh, live material in uh, section form, and then look at the more uh, refined stained microscope slides and all that kind of thing. You have to get, uh, well, repeating, I guess, direct contact with the material. I don't know if I have any special gimmicks there. Do you suppose, uh, would you say that you, you uh, leave a great deal of responsibility to the student for finding out uh, about the material under investigation? Or I, well, I guess, or would the student would the student have uh, have the answers before they go into the lab, or or would they be looking and and learning, looking at these things and learning about them in the laboratory? Well, I think it works both ways. You can't find out, you can't interpret very intelligently unless you know what to expect to some extent. 
I think somebody has said that you never see anything unless you know what you're looking for, which is a little cynical. But it can be fairly true to some extent. I don't really um, use the method that I've sometimes heard described of having uh, uh, the student just do the investigation and come in with a total blank. That has its points, I suppose, if you have a lot of time, but our schedules are usually pretty pretty uh, cramped as far as that's concerned in uh, getting through with the material that you need to have illustrated, uh, coordinated with the class and other types of things. I know that you do have the students, particularly in, in uh, anatomy courses, plant anatomy mm -hmm. courses, do a great deal of, of drawing of, of uh, plant tissues and structures. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, because as uh, Louis Agassiz said, your eye is at the point of your pencil. It's amazing how much you see when you have to look at something long enough to think about making a picture of it. Now, I know that uh, printed drawings are a tremendous time advantage, but I think uh, making your own pictures helps you see. It's a little hard, I think, perhaps, for somebody to realize that that isn't on that side of the fence, possibly. But I think it does. It makes it so that a student won't just uh, have this thing and take a quick glance and say, OK, I've seen that. I've seen one, I've seen them all, and what of it, and so forth. If you have to figure uh, proportions, and there's nothing that can show up the quality of a student's observation and the kind of lab drawings it, it turns in. It improves the student's ability to observe. It, it allows him to yes. develop his powers of yes. observation. I'm thinking about those beautiful little LED cells we always look at. Right. Always. And uh, I could look at an LED cell for 40 more years and still enjoy getting that LED cell. And that uh, reminds me of something else that uh, is important along here and that that is just taking delight in the beauty of these things we're looking at especially beautiful round nucleus a marvelous nucleolus and if you run across a little anaphase somewhere that's a real thrill and so on one just has to delight in what he finds. And I think most of the students that have had a uh, lab will remember from one time or another when I might squeal or to keep <laughs> myself from <laughs> being too ridiculous would jump up and down and silently because of something just absolutely marvelous that this student has found that we're taking a special delight in. I think that's an important thing. Study the organism. How, uh, how do you uh, decide what your students should learn in a class? How do you arrive at the depth and or breadth of material? What, how do you know what kinds of things a student should know about a particular area? That's a rather difficult question. Yes, that is a difficult question. <laughs> well, I don't know. I suppose um, being a morphologist, I think it's important to know the structure, the, yes, the structure of these organisms and how they work and somewhere within the framework of the time that's given to you in a given semester, you see how far you can go in certain areas here. You start with your students at a particular point and take them as far as time will allow. Is that? Uh... Well, you know that when you have a certain course, you have uh, the semester of a certain length and certain types of things that are supposed to, to uh, happen in that course, like this general botany class, of course, has the structure of the, the higher plant and then all of the uh, 
plants in the whole uh, plant kingdom. You know, you have that to consider life cycles, evolutionary relationships, and so forth. I don't know as I ever sat down and analyzed particularly uh, could a person survive if he didn't happen to get exposed to this particular concept because you know perfectly well they're going to forget nine-tenths of it anyway. Or are they? Probably, probably. Certainly a good, a, a good part of the factual material. Mm-hmm. How, uh, how do you evaluate your students? Do well, you the pet ways testing, of, of evaluating? Well, uh, let's start out with anathema. Everybody has to give tests, of course. You can't get around that. You've got to give somebody, a, you've got to give them a grade. Yeah, that's right. But uh, I do not like uh, objective questions, which are almost necessary when you have these classes of hundreds of students and that kind of thing. And you have to have definitions and sh some short things like that, but I like to uh, give questions that require organizing something or demonstrating that they can follow through on something, development of something, or instead of just trying to say uh, what uh, Oh, what food does pepsin work on? Or uh, something of that kind. Say, supposing you had uh, had a hamburger for lunch, what happens to it in your digestive tract? And then have them follow the whole thing through. Do you uh, like to uh, examine your students orally, or would you would you prefer oral no. examination or written, or do you use both types of exams? Well, oral. I, I might say oral exams are a tradition going all the way back to uh, Mr. Carlson's time. He was strong on oral exams and in his day uh, between us with Mr. Carlson and me and two or three student assistants we used to give 15 minute oral exams to everybody in one of those classes of 50, 60 students. How would, you, how would you give an oral exam? Could you give us an example of that? Well, well supposing we'd finished a section on the uh, growth of stems, say, all right, a student would come in and, and you'd say, all, all right, here's plenty of scratch paper. I hope you have a pencil. Uh, just explain to me how this uh, plant grows. And illustrate your talk, of course. And that uh, brings me to something else. One of the most important ways about going after this material from a morphologist standpoint, of course, is visualization. You've got to have that mental image. And the quickest way to show that a student is weak on his mental image is to ask him to make a picture of it or to illustrate what he's talking about. And as a study method, if a student cannot of draw all the stages in this life cycle or illustrate this business about how this stem grows, uh, he's in deep trouble. On back to the, the, the oral exam question showing how a, a plant uh, develops, you mean as if they were beginning with a seed and the seed would germinate and you'd start with the, the embryonic stages and go through the root development and the stem development and uh, well, tissues in these. You know, that would depend on the particular type of thing that was up for that particular test. If it were just a thing on the growth of stems, you'd uh, grant him a full-grown plant. Okay. But uh, another favorite thing, and this is a, uh, shall I say, a lifelong frustration, is a favorite device that Mr. Carlson had that I still think is a good one. He would insist every year that the students write, and this wasn't oral, they prepare and come in with a, uh, plenty of blank paper available, write an essay on the living plant. And that would mean something like what you had suggested there. They could start with the seed. And the idea is to correlate everything they had had 
that uh, semester. And in those days, of course, we had all the processes that we now have in this principal's class, in the general botany class. So they started in with this seed germinating and tried to put it all together to explain exactly what happened as that seed enlarged. The imbibition of the water and osmosis and digestion and all that before the thing could even start to grow. All right, then it starts growing. You've got that meristem going. All right, you've got to explain about the meristem and as it differentiates the uh, uh, pattern of differentiation in the root and so forth and so forth and so forth. That goes on and on and on. And then they would be granted a mature plant as their seed grew up. And then finally the thing could be a tree to get into wood and cambium and so forth. And you'd be surprised how few students really get the thrill of that correlation. That is, how many of them really get it. And I don't know but what that's the supreme achievement, is the correlation. A person that could do that would certainly understand the introductory botany. That's <laughs> yes, that's, and that was the idea. Sure. That's the idea. Sure. It's a beautiful yes. question. Yes, yes, and um, that in turn leads to uh, something else here. Somebody would ask, uh, what's your objective in teaching? You know, all these lists and so forth. I'd say my major thing is to encourage appreciation of nature, to realize what's going on out there. If you just sit and think about it, it really, uh, it really curls your hair or boggles your mind or something else from the standpoint of that correlation. Sure. Now, just try it. Out there, all the, of course now, the, it's easier in the fall when there's still <laughs> green grass and a few other things. But to just realize how many trillions of cells, trillions of nuclei, are in all those organisms out there. And then think of that now and then, and as you stroll around the campus, as you visit other parts of the world or parts of the country, see these other marvelous plants, just realize and appreciate what you have around you all the time. Of course, it's, it's that wonder that keeps us in biology. Yes, yes, I should say. I'd like to, uh, if you assigned a reading, a certain section in the textbook to your students, uh, pages 35 through 45, I want you to know this material for the class on Wednesday. You came to class on Wednesday and the students didn't know the material. Maybe hadn't, you might suspect that they hadn't read the material, what would you do? Give them a good look and walk out. <laughs> Say that's the assignment for Friday. Okay. That's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've almost I, 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 done I, that on occasion. <laughs> I think I recall when that did happen once, oh. so that's the reason I asked. <laughs> oh, so you knew what you were going to get for an answer, did you? Well, I was going to say, I, I don't give assignments as okay. a rule. We're, we're studying stems or we're studying this. Any intelligent person should know what the general topic under consideration is. Use an index, a table of contents, and there you are. Okay. I think that's the level of the college student, that you shouldn't have to be told what pages between what and what. Although there would be occasions, I suppose, sure. when there would be a certain section of that kind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't uh, have any other questions particularly in mind. Did Should you I any? say thank goodness? <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. Do you have anything else that... Uh... I don't think of it right now, no. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. For You're this. certainly welcome. <laughs>